Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Father Irwin, and this is Friday Morning Theology with Father Irwin. And we're going to talk about the sacraments today, particularly the sacraments in Scripture. And so I'm um, looking forward to this. If you are tuning in or viewing live right now, welcome to all of you and glad that you are here with me for this short period of time. And if you watch later, um, thank you for clicking on there and watching. And it will also be on the St. Joseph YouTube um, channel at some point during this week. You can watch it on Facebook or on our, our YouTube. And so I hope you have a good cup of coffee or something that you like to drink in the morning. And let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for giving us the sacraments of the Church, the sacramental life of the Church, is the means through which we encounter your love and grace that saves and sanctifies our souls. When we encounter the sacraments of the church, we encounter you, Jesus. Each day through the sacraments, people come to know you, love you, and serve you more. Help us to grow a deep and a deeper understanding of these sacraments, especially through the Word of God. We ask these prayers and all our prayers through Jesus Christ, who is Lord forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'm just going to jump right in. You know, there's seven sacraments of the Church. Baptism, Confirmation, and the Eucharist, Penance, or the Sacrament of Penance and Reconciliation, or sometimes called Confession, the Anointing of the Sick, Holy Orders, and Holy Matrimony. Now I'm going to show just briefly uh, that you can find evidence of these sacraments in Scripture, particularly in the New Testament. So the Lord has revealed to us this sacramental life through his church. So he first establishes the church. And we hear that when he takes his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi. And he says to Peter, you are rock. And upon this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So he establishes the church, which is his body. And so the church itself is a sacrament, a sacramental reality, because it is an outward sign of Christ's, his body, instituted by the Lord. And it's through the church that we receive grace, the grace of the sacraments. But within the church, there are, the, there are these particular sacraments that the Lord has instituted so that we can live our life within the church in the best way possible. And so we have the sacraments of initiation, which makes us full-fledged members of Christ's body, because we want to be full members of the body of Christ. We want to be part of the communion of saints. So through our baptism and confirmation and sustained through the Eucharist, we are members of Christ's body on earth and in heaven, we pray one day in heaven, hopefully. And so we also receive these sacraments of healing, penance and anointing. So we need forgiveness, we need mercy, because we are fallen creatures and we, we need the, the constant mercy and grace of God to restore us and bring us back to life, bring us back into communion with the church, because we know that sin, especially serious mortal sin, takes us out of communion with the church. We don't want that. We want to be in full communion with God and his church. Then when we are sick, especially when we are dying, or when we are experiencing something that could be uh, the cause of death, or when we're experiencing sickness, illness, disease, serious surgery, we need the anointing of the sick. The anointing of the sick prepares our soul to encounter Christ. It forgives sins. It helps us to receive healing 
grace. Sometimes not just, you know, preparing for, um, for death, but also that sacrament can bring he real healing. And we know that we believe that because of what Christ has taught us and showed us in the scriptures. But he did tell us, uh, particularly through James, the apostle James, that anyone who is sick, let them sin for the priests of the church. And so the priest comes to anoint them and pray with them. Then there's the sacraments of the uh, of service in the church. Holy orders. This is where we get the priesthood, the holy priesthood of Jesus Christ. Deacons, priests, and bishops are all, all who have received this sacrament of holy orders. And then finally, holy matrimony. Holy matrimony is such an important foundational sacrament. In a sense, it's like the first sacrament. The Lord creates man and woman and helps them to live together in harmony in this great covenant of love so that they can be true witnesses of Christ in the world, witnesses of, of Christ's love. Okay, so let's just look at these sacraments in Scripture. Starting with baptism, so we'll start with the sacraments of initiation. We want to um, first turn to probably one of the most important scriptures in regards to the sacrament, because within the church, the, we would say that this is the sacrament where Jesus institutes this particular sacrament of baptism. And it's the at the end of Matthew's gospel, at the Great Commission. So if you go to Matthew 28... If you have your Bible with you, we're going to go to Matthew 28. Okay. Good. It's the end of Matthew's gospel. He's commissioning his disciples. And what he says to them is very important. The eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had ordered them. When they saw him, they worshipped, but they doubted. Then Jesus approached... And said to them, all power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have, all have, all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always till the end of the age. So at the very end, as Jesus is ascending to heaven, he commissions his disciples to do three things. To go make disciples, to teach them the faith, and to baptize them. And in the early days of the church... Oh, I'm sorry. Is, are people not able to hear? Hold on. I'm seeing the script. Can you hear me and see me? Somebody let me know. Anyways, I'm going to keep going. <laughs> okay. If the question is if you can watch this on YouTube later, yes, you can. All right. So baptism is one of the uh, commands of Jesus to his disciples to teach the faith, to make disciples, and to baptize them. This is how we, part of how we make disciples within the church. We bring them into communion with the church, making them members of Christ's body through the waters of baptism. Okay. Look at John 3, 5. We're going to John chapter 3 also. Okay. I'm going to start at the beginning. Okay. It says here in John chapter 3, Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one can do these signs that you are doing unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said, to him, how can a person once grown old be born again? Surely he cannot re-enter his mother's womb and be born again, can he? Uh, and this is a, a crucial part of the teaching of the sacrament of baptism. There's a death and rebirth 
through the waters and grace of God's love and baptism. So Jesus answered, Amen, amen, I say to you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh, and what is born of spirit is spirit. So Jesus clearly speaks of being born again requiring baptism, water and the spirit. So he's referring to the baptism baptism that he then commissions his disciples to to do okay i might offer a few more scriptures if you'd like to look them up yourself corinthians 12 around verse 13 ephesians 5 25 to 26 colossians 2 12 and first peter 3 20 to 21 those scriptures will help you to understand even further not only the importance of baptism why baptism is essential to the life of faith and to receiving heavenly glory. Now we're going to look at confirmation. Confirmation, really, we're just going to look at Acts 2, which is Pentecost. There are some other scriptures we could look at, particularly scriptures that speak more specifically to the disciples laying on hands, which is a part of the sacrament, anointing people with oil, but in Acts chapter 2, when, when we have this Pentecost moment where the disciples are in the upper room and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, this is um, often referred to as this great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, which is what we receive at confirmation. At confirmation, the Spirit is poured into our hearts and minds fully. We're strengthened by the Holy Spirit, it strengthens baptismal grace, and it, there's this outpouring of the gifts and the charisms of the Holy Spirit. So in, in chapter 2, right at the beginning, when the time for Pentecost was fulfilled, they were all in one place together. And suddenly there came from the sky a noise like a strong driving wind, and it filled the entire house in which they were. Then there appeared to them tongues as a fire which parted and came to rest on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them to proclaim. And so this being filled with the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, this is the essential part of the sacrament of confirmation. So we have these two sacraments that really go together. Baptism, which is sort of the beginning of sacramental life and sacramental grace within the church. And then this completion of the sacrament, the grace of baptism, which is confirmation, which is a strengthening of that so we can go out and be disciples, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus, making other disciples, being true apostles of the Lord. Okay. Now we're going to look at the sacrament of the Eucharist and really the most important, well, there are a lot of important scriptures for the Eucharist, particularly all of the Last Supper accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Today I just want to turn to John 6, John chapter 6, because this particular scripture really gives us in a deep way the teaching of the Eucharist. So in John chapter 6, really starting around verse 22, and then going all the way to the end. I'm not going to read all of this today, but I encourage you to read all of John chapter 6, particularly 22 to the end. Let me just read part of what it says here. This is around verse 52. The Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat. Jesus said to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. 
just as a living father sent me and I have life because of the father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. And like your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread, his flesh and blood, will live forever. I added that, his flesh and blood, but he's making that connection. The bread that they want, Jesus says, is his flesh and blood. The Eucharist. Okay? So read and pray with John chapter 6 to, in a deep way, fully understand the Holy Eucharist. I'm going to jump to penance. The institution of the sacrament of the Eucharist really is in the institution narratives of the Last Supper, but also John chapter 6. The institution of the sacrament of confession or penance and reconciliation is in John chapter 20. So move the, if you look at John chapter 20, and we're going to look at verses 21 and 20 to 23. Okay. Good. Actually, I'm going to start at 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. So this is after the resurrection. Jesus appears to the disciples. This is before Pentecost. This is like an early Pentecost, if you will. So he comes and he stands in their midst and he says, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So he's showing them his wounds that, to prove that it is him. It is really Jesus. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. He's commissioning them. He's saying, I'm sending you out to be apostles. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. So he's giving them the power of the Holy Spirit. He's commissioning them and giving them authority through the Holy Spirit. This, in a way, is kind of an, an ordination, too. Just like what we receive at our ordination as priests. But he's received, so he says, receive the Holy Spirit. And this is the key in verse 23. Jesus says, to the apostles, whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, whose sins you retain are retained. So he gives them specifically in John 20, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the charism to forgive sins. And the apostles, of course, become the first bishops, and they ordain and give that power and charism to the priests of the church. It all begins here when Jesus gives them the power to forgive sins. It's an interesting part of the gospel because... You know, many would say that only God can forgive. But Jesus specifically gives his apostles, who are just men, chosen, chosen, of course, by him, the power to forgive sins. So this ministry of reconciliation and penance begins right here at the beginning of the church's life. Okay, let's move on to anointing of the sick. This really comes to us in the book of James, okay? It's James 5, 3 through 15. James 5, 3 through 15. Okay? James 5, 3 through 15. Oh, 13 through 15. James 5, 13 through 15. Okay. Quick little part here, but James speaks to a, um, a ministry that was happening early on. And actually, he speaks a little bit of confession here, too. So in 3 through 15, he says, Is anyone among you suffering? They should pray. Is anyone in good spirits? They should sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? He should summon the presbyters of the church 
and they should pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If they've committed any sins, their sins will be forgiven. And this is interesting. He goes on the same to verse 16, and this echoes to uh, confession. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So confessing sins is a really important part of our life. Praying for each other is a part important part of our life. And so come to the sacrament of penance. Holy orders. I want to go to John 13 for this. Because the sacrament of holy orders is instituted at the washing of the disciples' feet. This is actually the moment where Jesus institutes the Holy Eucharist, the Last Supper. But in John 13, in John's Gospel, he doesn't actually give an account of the Last Supper. He gives an account <coughs> of the washing of the disciples' feet. And you'll see that it says, during the supper, so it's at the part, it's at a, an important part of uh, the celebration of the Passover and the Last Supper, that he does this. And so I'm in John chapter 13, it's verses 1 through 20. There's a lot here, okay? And so um, I want to jump, I want you to read verse 1 through 20. John 13 Verses 1 through 20. This is really where Jesus institutes the priesthood. Okay? And there are lots of other moments in Scripture that we could read where you see the priesthood being enacted, especially in the Acts of the Apostles. Right? Um, but Jesus, when he washes the feet of his disciples, this is where he institutes the sacrament. For the Feast of Passover, Jesus knew that this hour had come to pass from this world to the Father. He loved his own in the world, and he loved them to the end. The devil had already induced Judas, son of Simon the Iscariot, to hand him over. And so during supper, fully aware that the Father had put everything into his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God, he rose from supper and took off his outer garments. He took a towel and tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and dry them with the towel around his waist. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Master, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What am I doing? You do not, what I am doing, you do not understand now but you will understand later. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you will have no inheritance with me. Simon Peter said to him, master, then not only my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus said to him, whoever has bathed has no need except to have his feet washed, for he is clean all over. So you are clean, but not all, for he knew who would betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. So when he had washed their feet and put his garments back on and reclined at table, he said to them, do you realize what I have done for you? You call me teacher and master and rightly so, for indeed I am. If I therefore, the master and teacher, have washed your feet... You ought to wash one another's feet. I have given you a model to follow, so that as I have done for you, you should also do. This is a beautiful scripture, a beautiful gesture, and really the essence of the priesthood. Jesus says, every priest, every person with authority, every leader. Certainly within the priesthood, we're called to serve and not be served, to give our life as a ransom for many, to bring the gospel of Jesus to the world, to wash the feet, either literally or certainly symbolically, in the way we serve, in the way we lay down our life. So the priesthood is instituted in this moment. He gives his 
disciples this charism of service, of washing the feet of their of all who come to, to them to lay down their life. There's another part in John's Gospel where he's speaking specifically to John. And it's at the end of the Gospel. Or excuse me, speaking specifically to Peter. And uh, Peter, you know, had betrayed Jesus. And Jesus says to him three times, Do you love me? And at the end of that part of the Gospel... After the third, do you love me? Jesus says to Peter. He says, Amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you, lead you where you do not want to go. He said this signifying what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had said this, he said to him, follow me. So he's basically telling Peter, you're going to lay down your life for the gospel. You're going to die for it. Follow me in that. That's really for every disciple and certainly for the priesthood. And finally, the sacrament of matrimony, of marriage. And I'd like to uh, go to Matthew 19 for that. Matthew 19. So in Matthew 19, um, Jesus, you know, is asked about marriage and divorce, and he quotes Genesis here. And so right at the beginning, I'll just read verse 1 through 6. When Jesus finished these words, he left Galilee and went to the district of Judea across the Jordan. Great crowds followed him, and he cured them there. Some Pharisees approached him and tested him, saying, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause, whatever? He said in reply, Have you not read that from the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, no human being must separate. And so he goes on to specify a little more about this question of divorce. But marriage, you know, begins really in Genesis. The institution of marriage is an incredibly important part of the life of the church, of the life of the world. Every society has marriage in some form or another, every culture. So this is something that God created as was a part of creation. Man and woman, they would come together in this bond of matrimony, this bond of love, so that they could love each other, so that they could bless the world with more human beings through procreation and the education of children, so they could be a sign of Christ's love for his church. And so um, I won't read this today because we're running it. We've, we're running long, and that's okay. But if you look in Ephesians chapter 5, particularly verses 31 and 32 but in that scripture Jesus actually or Jesus or Paul excuse me Paul actually relates marriage the bridegroom and the bride to Jesus on the cross and his church Jesus being the bridegroom and the church being the bride so the essence of marriage is that we lay the bride and the groom they give their life fully and completely to each other, and that they receive that offering of love. Just as Christ offered his life on the cross for the church, and we in turn have to respond by saying, Lord, I will follow you to the end. Okay. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you got a little bit out of it. The sacraments in Scripture, they're all there. And it's a beautiful truth, a beautiful teaching, a beautiful part of our faith. We have to live and understand more fully the sacramental life. It's part of Jesus' plan for the world, for the salvation of the world. God bless you all, and have a wonderful weekend. Pray for Deacon Robert Miller, who will be ordained a priest tomorrow at Our Lady's Cathedral. May he have a wonderful weekend and be blessed in his priesthood. God bless you.